Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 697. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Grays Lake, Illinois, here at Reformed Forum, and I'm delighted to be in studio for another fun conversation. We're going to get into the book of Acts today, looking at biblical theology and uh, some Old Testament references and how they're used in Acts 2 through 3. But to do that, we have with us one of our good friends. We have Adam York. Adam serves as the pastor of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church here in Grays Lake, where I used to be. I still am on session, but Adam's the pastor there now in the studio for the first time for a recording. Welcome, Adam. It's good to see you. Glad to be here. Glad to be here in person. Yeah. <laughs> so. Adam's been around, uh, obviously, on the program and certainly on our network, so to speak, uh, talking about uh, various things, especially over on our program, Proclaiming Christ. And he's been over here in the studio for uh, course recordings in the background. I don't know if we could catch a, a laugh of yours or something in the Probably. background tracks. Maybe we can give a prize <laughs> to somebody who can find that, uh, if there are any Adam Easter eggs or anything of the sort. Uh, but we're delighted to to have Adam with us today. And we're also delighted to be speaking with our guest, uh, Dr. Rita Cephalou, who's a writer and lecturer in biblical and theological studies, now out of uh, Florida. She's also doing some teaching at the University of St. Catharines in a variety of capacities. She's been on the program before, but welcome back, Rita. It's so good to see you today. Thanks, Camden. It's great to be here. We are really excited to be speaking about Acts 2 and 3. Uh, with Rita. We've had her on the program before. Uh, she spoke about uh, Genesis 6 and one of those really interesting yet uh, tricky, complicated passages. We talk about the Nephilim and Adam was with us even for that episode. We had a great time and I'll have a link to that in the episode description. But today we're going to be speaking about this book, The Seed of Promise, The Sufferings and Glory of the Messiah. This is a festrift. Uh, these are essays in honor of T. Desmond Alexander. It's edited by uh, Paul R. Williamson and our guest today, Rita Cephalou, and uh, it's uh, published by uh, Glossa House. So we're excited to open this up and talk about the book and about Acts 2 through 3 in particular, because Rita's chapter here is titled The Sufferings and Glory of Jesus the Messiah in Acts 2 through 3. You can find that on pages 285 through 298 when you get your copy of the book. But more generally speaking, we can talk about the project. And Rita, we'll just open right up and ask you, how did you come to know uh, Dr. T. Desmond Alexander? And can you tell us a bit about him? Oh, sure. Um, well, we go back to about, I think, 2007, when I began corresponding with him over email. I was looking to do uh, a PhD, and I wanted to find someone that shared my Christian convictions as well as love for biblical theology. And because I've always been told, and I believe this, that uh, it's who you study with. Uh, they have a profound shaping influence on your life. So it's not just about a pedigree, but it's about the person you study under. And I had actually come across some of his articles, and particularly one article called On the Seed, the seed theme. And that is found in his uh, dictionary of uh, the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology, which you're probably aware of, co-edited by him, Brian Rosner, and others. And um, so I read that article and others, and I was very impressed with his uh, biblical theology. And so I reached out to him, Queen's University of Belfast, and we started a conversation. And uh, he helped me discern a project, a potential project, PhD project. And so it took about a year to really discern, you know, whether or not he would accept me as a student. And then, of course, I had to go through the application process once he did. And so basically, I met him. <clears throat> he was my PhD supervisor mm -hmm. and um, then became a friend over a course of years. I was part time mm -hmm. as a PhD student because I had other commitments. I was teaching already and um, had some family commitments as well. So we've known each other for a long time. And uh yeah, that's how I got to know him. I have an article I've written about him. It's up on the Layman's Lounge website. So if you'd want, if anyone, any of your listeners are interested in reading more about him personally and his journey with respect to biblical theology, um, you can find that on their website, the Layman's Lounge. Sure. Yeah, and we're, we're familiar with that. Alexander, we'll yeah. put a link to that in the episode description as well. That's wonderful. There's a lot of, or many, uh, contributors here to this book. It's it's wonderful um, hearing your interaction with Dr. Alexander and, and your friendship. But 
you know, not everyone receives a, a Feshrift. One here is certainly well-deserving, but how did this particular book come about? Uh, when, when did you start thinking about this and putting it together? Thanks for asking that. I suppose I had it uh, on my mind, toward, especially towards the end of the process of the PhD, just because of what a, a wonderful mentor he had been. And, um, and so I had also put together a short book list of things, I, ideas I had while in the process. As you know, how you get all ideas, all these ideas come to mind when you're doing your research and reading. And one of them was on the theme of the sufferings and glory of the Messiah in the Old and New Testaments. Mm -hmm. The other idea was to write, you know, to get, to work with Paul Williamson. I already had him in mind because uh, T.D. Alexander had, he had been one of T.D. Alexander's students as well. And he, he had some experience in publishing and so forth. So I wanted to work with someone who was more seasoned. Um, in, in the process. So he was the co-editor I had in mind. Um, and so I wanted to produce a fesh script for him in honor of him. And at the same time, I also a book. And so I thought that the two, by combining them would, you know, accomplish both goals. And that's, that's the original idea. And so I reached out to Paul, um, who is at Moore Theological College, you know, very well known for their biblical theology. Yes, very much. And he was just delighted to take on the project and pretty much every, actually I have to say hands down, every person that was able to commit, everybody wanted to that we reached out to, but everyone that was able to commit, there was no hesitation. They, they were delighted to do so. So that, that speaks volumes also for the honoree. That's wonderful. I love hearing, uh, you know, the backstory to various books and how things come together. Uh, but this one also is is highly focused. And that's something we don't always see with Fest Shrifts. One of my gripes with Fest Shrifts, I have two, and neither of yours, your, yours is not subject to these gripes. But I even contributed to one to, that sometimes falls into this. Either, a lot of times a guy, people will edit the Fest Shrift and they want people to contribute. And, um, and, they, and people might be busy for various reasons. We understand this, but they, they'll say, oh, well, I've got this, this article I'm half, I've half worked on on my hard drive. Can I just turn that in and you use it for the Feshrift? So you end up sometimes with these hyper eclectic collections that may or may not have much to do with the actual work of the person that you're celebrating in the, in the Feshrift. And, and so then also there's a lack of cohesion also with the volume as a whole, but this Feshrif uh, has all the all the essays are focused on a particular biblical theme, yet from various portions of Scripture, which I thought was just a tremendous idea and uh, well executed. It's very interesting uh, to read it from that perspective because not only do we get the various biblical perspectives on Matt on this theme, but we also get different perspectives from different authors, all with a view towards. Um, you know, deeper understanding of God's word ultimately and glorifying the Lord in that regard, but also in, in a way, you know, celebrating the, the life work of Dr. Alexander. So I'm curious if you could explain to us what the biblical theme of this volume is and why that was chosen. Well, sure. It's interesting that you would raise those those main issues regarding a fesh grip because those that was our concern. The original idea was to focus our contributors to direct them and say, this is what we want, you know, not that article that you have lying, you know. <laughs> Which might be really good, but. <laughs> but uh, we didn't say it that way, of course. Right. <laughs> um, but so it was broader, you know, the sufferings and glory of the Messiah. But Paul was the one who, who narrowed it down into the seat of promise, even further narrowing the focus. Um, with the subtitle then being the sufferings and glory. So uh, he, we knew, as you just stated, that it's very difficult even to publish a Feshkrift because most publishers don't want to take on something that would potentially be eclectic. You know, someone, people aren't necessarily going to buy it to read just one essay, you know, or two essays that, that they, they need for something. So to produce a book that actually has cohesiveness, like you said, even though it multi authors have contributed to it, you know, is, is what we were after or something like that, that not only a, what publisher would take up because it was a worthy project and we wanted to see it published and great contributors, you know, internationally uh, contributing to this volume, but um, 
you know, we knew that, that it had to have some more cohesiveness in order for it to, for someone to pick it up. Thankfully, we had two. So Glossa House was, was the one that was, and then of course we had uh, Whip in stock, I think was the other one. But anyway, we went with Glossa House, Glossa House, I think that's how I say it. Um, and they were terrific to work with. So that was the reason um, to wanting to get that, get a publisher, the practical aspect of it. And then um, uh, we want it to be a volume that, 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 that hung together well, if you will. So we um, thought about, intentionally thought about uh, people who knew Desi. Uh, Desi is his nickname, uh, T. Desmond yeah. Alexander. So you'll right. hear me sometimes say Desi. Um, his friends call him Desi and his students call him Desi. So anyway, um, we reached out to them and people that were known for their particular areas of the Bible. So when we reached out, like, for example, to Graham Goldsworthy, he was he's known for a lot, but for his, the wis, his work in the wisdom literature. So we were very mindful of and intentional to reach out to scholars who had a working relationship or a student working relationship with him or some professional relationship in which they had benefited from his work and were known for their particular books of the Bible. And then we asked them to contribute to that particular theme. And so we tried to put it together canonically so that it would have that feel that you just described, or, you know, cohesiveness yeah. uh, to it. Um, and so the seed of promise was a perfect place to start, right? Genesis 3.15. And it's a, it's a topic very close to Dr. Alexander's heart. Um, he's done a lot of work, as you know, on that to show that uh, not just from a New Testament point of view, but even the Old Testament. There has the Hebrew Bible has a, an expectation of a coming seed who is of the ro a royal seed, and uh, he sh he demonstrates that very well in several articles that he has written and his book on the, or his article on the seed, and then um, you know from prom Paradise to Promised Land and so forth. There are other places this messianic theme occurs um and so it just it just it all just fit together really well rita it's just it was a delight to read your article but uh and, and as camden recently sent that to me and i had an opportunity to i wasn't aware of it appearing in this volume and so you know having told us a little bit about the central focus of the seed of promise um i, I would particularly like to hear about the other contributors and how their contributions tie into uh, the overall topic? Well, um, I'd have to go back over each, it's been a while since we actually published it and you know, our heads were in it for two years or maybe more, actually four years all together, but- uh, You don't have to go into great specifics, just to whatever uh, thoughts pop into your mind. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, we start off with Jim Hamilton, James Hamilton's uh, you know, groundbreaking breaking essay on, uh, demonstrating Genesis 3.15 as a messianic text. And that was published before with uh, the Southern Baptist Journal. And with permission, they granted us uh, that to be able to use it as sort of the piece that set, um, that put everything in motion. And then you've got, um, you have Sarah, who is one of his former students who's contributing to the Pentateuch and her, her work was well known for that. Um, I'm, I, I'm, John Oswald, who's always been one of my uh, favorite scholars in the book of Isaiah, does an amazing job in Kings and Kingdoms, um, that particular essay. I mean, Stephen Dempster and um, his. These are quite a few James, names. Yeah, I mean, I could go on and on. I love uh, all of them, really. Andreas Kostenberger does a phenomenal job on the Johannine literature and mm -hmm. Revelation. Um, and uh, I thought Dane Ortland, fantastic on Mark, mm -hmm. you know, his, the sufferings and glory of Messiah uh, with respect to the um, transfiguration. Um, we, we obviously were a little thin on the New Testament area. That was why I'm an Old Testament mainly, but being biblical theology, you go across the Testaments. We had plenty of old OT scholars to, to draw from. Um, and, and so I ended up, and happily so, uh, you know, wanting to fill out more of the New Testament. Um, some that, you know, we would have liked to fill out more that body. We had probably more representation in the Old Testament component. But so Paul's essay comes at the very end, Snakes and Dragons, um, tracing that theme throughout from Genesis to Revelation. Um, oh, that really makes me want to get a hold of the 
Well, book yeah. then. You can't even better hold on to your copy when take, I leave. He's going to take mine home. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> we'll take it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, there's so much to, to discuss. And obviously, I mean, we can have other episodes down the road to dive into some of these other uh, particular uh, chapters. But at, th- at this moment, we certainly want to focus on your essay regarding Acts 2 and 3. And there, this is just an enormous portion of scripture because there's so much going on from a, a redemptive historical standpoint. This is just, um, I'd say, cosmic shifts, but it's more than just the cosmos <laughs> in terms of, uh, we're talking we're the heavenly shifts too, in terms of what the, the Lord has done, uh, you know, in his resurrection, but then also here um, in pouring out his spirit. So not to, uh, to, uh, you know, give away uh, what you might want to speak about, but I'm curious if you could set the stage for us a bit and tell us about the redemptive historical setting of Acts, particularly chapters two and three, which are the focus of this particular chapter. Well, sure. Um, the redemptive historical setting, as most people know that have read Acts or are familiar with it, is uh, Jesus. Uh, it, Luke Acts, Acts picks up where Luke ends, um, written by the same author, with Jesus still present. He is yet to ascend and to be taken up into heaven. And he, we are told in chapter one of Acts that he is uh, on the earth or appearing to several of his disciples and many others uh, over a 40-day period. So that would link his appearances after his resurrection with the uh, his death, which is also was during the time of the Passover. And Pentecost, or the Feast of the Harvest, or Festival of the Harvest, typically occurred um, on the Jewish calendar 50 days after this, the, uh, the Passover. So it's intriguing that we have this 40 days that Jesus is there. He then tells his apostles and to go back to Jerusalem and to wait until they receive power. Uh, from the Holy Spirit, basically, that you will receive power, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will be my witnesses. And then you have, you know, Acts 1, 7, as I believe it's chapter 7, or verse 7, as the sort of key or the frame for the whole book of Acts. Um, No, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth is then taken up into heaven. They go back and do as he instructed, and it is on the day of Pentecost. So presumably 10 days later, uh, which would be the festival of the, of the harvest of the first fruits, um, you have this, this extraordinary event that happens where they're all 120 are gathered together, all together, including the apostles. And, and all of a sudden, it's great rushing wind, as you know, and flames of fire appear over the head. They begin speaking in foreign languages, declaring the praises of God. They're gathered for the feast of Pentecost. And people hear them, devout Jews from all over who've made this pilgrimage. Um, and the pilgrimage had, it, it was to celebrate the, um, the Feast of the First Fruits, the end of the harvest, to come to bring your tithes and offerings, to present to God in, in view of gratitude for his provision, as well as thankfulness, uh, even remembering the Exodus, remembering what their ancestors went, went through. And so it's all connected there. And they hear uh, these people that have come from all over the then known world hearing the praises of God in their own languages. And they're like, what is this? Right. <laughs> and they think he's drunk. And, he's, and he, he says, no, they're, they're drunk, all the people, you know. Right. It's, it's not even that hour, you know, that, that, uh, the correct hour to be drunk, if you will. <laughs> As if gotta, you couldn't drink wait a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he then begins to boldly preach. And we, we have to remember, it's because he's now filled with the Spirit himself. So what he's, what he's preaching is, is Spirit-filled words, you know, and the Spirit gives him that utterance to link this event, this phenomena, with um, what Joel promised in, in chapter two, you know, um, in the latter days, which would be the messianic age, um, the age of the new covenant, right? In the latter days, he says, no, I'm not drunk, we're not drunk. It's not that, it's this. This is what yeah. is occurring, the fulfillment mm-hmm. of the prophecy of Joel. And and it's it's men, women of various classes now, you know, having to get their prophecy ecstatically, being able to declare 
the praises of God in languages that, that were not known to them. That phenomena is what happens there on the Feast of Pentecost. And I just saw in my essay, I didn't dwell too much on the Joel passage as much as I dwelled more, or don't even dwell, I just sort of in bypassing thought about, you know, if you're celebrating the first fruits of the harvest, which was an agrarian festival in Thanksgiving to God, here you have the first fruits because you have that idea of ingathering. You have 3,000 souls that are added to the number through that first sermon that Peter preaches. Um, and so it's an ingathering of souls. And that was sort of my connection to that, to that particular historical, redemptive historical setting. Perfect. Rita, uh, perhaps one of the reasons Camden asked me to come on this as well is I'm actually preaching through Acts right now, and I'm just so, oh, yes, and uh, I'm loving it and, and realizing that that Acts is so much more of a theological book than I think is often that, that it's sometimes thought. There's not much theology in there. Go to Paul's epistles if you want theology, but there's a rich theology, and, um, and you're bringing it out uh, chapters one, two, and three. It's just so um, integral. But help us uh, with respect to chapter two. And what, how do you understand sort of the center of Peter's message there? Uh, yes, I, I see the center of his message. Well, his burden, right, is to not only declare that these days have arrived, the messianic age has arrived, um, but to declare they've arrived on the basis of Jesus' death. Jesus, the person they crucified, they, they handed over to death. Um, nevertheless, according to God's predetermined plan, it wasn't didn't keep, catch God by surprise. It was all part of the plan. God raised him from the dead and has seated him at the right hand. And so the whole point is Jesus' exaltation to the throne of David, it's very surprising. You expect a, a, a throne in Jerusalem, but no, the throne is in the heavenly places. And it's it's because he has taken that throne, the Messianic age has begun, that he has now sent forth the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is the new covenant promise. And his burden is to show that, is to show that, to connect the Messianic age with Jesus, this Jesus whom you crucify, <laughs> by the way, is the Messiah. And he then grounds that in scripture to show that it's not his own idea, not even his, the spirit does that through him, um, that it is, it is something that's been prophesied in scripture and in the most unusual places, right? Mm -hmm. he, he draws from Psalm 16 and then Psalm 110, Psalm 110 being more familiar. Jesus himself uses that Psalm to stump the Pharisees and Sadducees. If you recall in all the gospels, remember that when, mm -hmm. Um, he says to them, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, Messiah, <laughs> have no you know, whose, son, whose son is he? And they go, oh, David, like, you know, dumb, <laughs> dumb, dumb question. And he says, well, then why does David call him Lord? That's right. <laughs> no Matthew answer to that. Says, After that, they never asked him any more questions. <laughs> you know? so, there wasn't uh, even so one guy <laughs> who said, well, let me explain the hypostatic union to you. you know? <laughs> Not even one of them. <laughs> Yeah, they're just like walk, walk. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> so it's this Jesus, classic Jesus. So and the the disciples were there, so they heard him. They heard him reference that. So no doubt, you know, um, they've got they they were able to go back to a lot of Old Testament scriptures and probably mining that the Holy Spirit leading them as well. You don't really see that with Psalm 16. That's a little bit of a a different kind of an application. Um, you know, that David wasn't speaking about himself when he, when he talked about, uh, because of his confidence in the Lord, you know, David had just a wonderful relationship with the Lord, despite his sins and failures. He, he was a man after God's own heart, as we know well. And um, the Lord loved David, and we love David when we read him. And we're sad in First Kings when we see the David that appears there versus the David that we remember in Samuel and the Psalms and all of that. But nonetheless... He's with the Lord. And so David saying he's confident that the, that the Lord, Yahweh, will not allow his body to undergo, undergo corruption. Peter says, because David knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he then wrote that psalm about Jesus in view of the resurrection. Mm. And he 
speaking of himself, he was, because David's body's still in the tomb, <laughs> Peter says, right? He's still with us, uh, the body. So obviously it underwent decay. So being a prophet and knowing God had sworn an oath, that second Samuel seven, I argue for that. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection from the dead. That, and then he quotes from the Psalm. And then he moves from there to actually Psalm 110. Um, this Jesus God raised up again to which we're all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, he has poured forth this, which you both see and hear. For it is not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. So I think the Davidic covenant, the oath of 2 Samuel 7, is what grounds David's exegesis of Psalm 16 and 110, death, mm. resurrection, and ascension because of that oath that was promised to him in Second Samuel 7. And, and I, I, uh, Rita, I'll just say this. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've, been, I've thought about that material as well. It's just so rich. And as I was reading through, um, I was a little skeptical at first about the thought that, you no, know, this is referencing Second Samuel 7, not uh, Psalm 132. But I think you won me over uh, in the course of your writing. So uh, I encourage people people, I mean, perhaps you want to say more about that, but if, if we want to move on and discuss things, I would encourage people to get and read that uh, portion. I, the article is worth it, I think, for that alone. I would like to go back and reflect a little more on that myself. Sure. So. Yeah. I think, you know, when you draw from like the use of the old and the new, that, that particular discipline, that hermeneutic, uh, scholars look for the exact language to replicate that, to find them the original right, source. Right, right, right. And that's what's driving most of the scholarship, I think. Right. But you bring and, up some and, very good and reasons. And sometimes bias against a messianic reading, you know, depending on who it is that's doing the scholarship. Um, and, you know, bias work on both ways, right, both sides of the aisle. But, um, but it just makes sense because David knew that he had sworn an oath. Well, it wasn't the psalmist of, you know, 132 that's David. He's a third-party person looking back at the event. That was um, very David, helpful for me. You know. <laughs> so the referent is, and where would he get the idea anyway? With, you know, again, they can argue when did Psalm, when was Psalm 130 written, and there's that <laughs> problem. But, um, you, you, know. you came out like seriatim, bang, bang, bang. I'm like, okay, well, I have a hard time answering those uh, thoughts. So I think I may just uh, go along with, with your, no, your, right. your well, reading. That's too. awesome. That's very helpful. Here. And I love the language of second Samuel seven. That's what really intrigued me. Um, oh my goodness. In the days uh, when you lie down with your father, with your fathers, right? All the patriarchs, um, I will raise up for you a seed. There's that seed language in second Samuel seven. And he's an individual, which you know I argue in this in this particular essay, but um, which nobody would. Well, uh, you know, obviously it was an individual king. You had Solomon. You didn't have a bunch of. You had maybe two kings, a north and a southern king after the split. But you would typically only have one king. But the language of raising up really just struck me. You know, at least to me in the Greek, kum in, in Hebrew, but. I will raise up your seed. And now, my new American standard says descendant, but I think seed is so much more powerful, especially yeah. when you're following the trajectory of the seed of promise, right. Genesis 3, right, 15. A coming seed after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom, again, a personal pronoun, his kingdom, a uh, pronominal suffix there in the Hebrew. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So... None of the kings of Israel, of the Davidic line, were able to establish an everlasting kingdom. And so I think that even what David was doing there, something akin to what uh, we see in the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 11, where Abraham received the promises of land, for example, but over time discerned, and with the help of the Spirit, that God was talking about something much greater than just the physical land of Canaan. Right. God was talking about something that was eternal. Amen. And, and, and so David must have thought something similar along those lines, you know, because he's linking the promise, the Davidic oath, with the resurrection. So there's a the connection. So this, this resurrection and ascension of 
the Davidic king to the throne is is something that has to be bigger than just the sons that are come down from my line, starting with Solomon, right? Mm. Um, something more permanent and eternal. So I think something like that is going on, if I may put ideas in the head of David via Peter. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, there's a lot of questions to ask, even biblically, theologically. How much did David know? How much more has Peter been made aware by the Holy Spirit himself? Exactly. You know, David, you know, we're not pure rationalistic and we're not critical scholars. We, you know, David doesn't have to necessarily know all the ways in which whatever he says or writes will be fulfilled for it to be a valid biblical theological connection here. And that also doesn't mean that Peter is just reappropriating the text and twisting it however he wants with some, you know, reading impo- Jesus back into reading the story. Jesus into the scriptures as <laughs> if Jesus isn't present organically in the Old Testament. Those are many of the debates that we've had in the last 10 or 15 years with post-conservative evangelicalism, you know, that the New Testament authors are have now been given license by the Holy Spirit to put something in that wasn't there originally. You know, Jesus is now the Holy Spirit inspired and stamped the stamp of approval to stamp a messianic character on texts that had no Christ in them on their own terms. We reject all of that. All right. And, you know, that's where Voss is so helpful, among many others, just orthodox conservative theologians, that God has been inspiring his word from beginning to end, and it's an organic whole. Uh, it's so much, it's just a much more comforting way to read the scriptures, and I'm thankful that it's the, the true and right way to read, to read them, too. <laughs> yeah, and I know that the debate continues, but, you know, um, right doctrine from the wrong text and all of that, that... And then questioning authorship and so forth. But I, I go back to Peter, the first epistle, right? And I, I share this in that in that article as well, where Peter talks oh, again, inspired verses chapter one, verses ten and following, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know right. what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was. Uh, predicting the sufferings and and the glories of the Messiah. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things, which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, even things angels long to look into. So they were not always aware. They knew it was for something else. They still had the Spirit of Christ. But like you said, Camden, with the person and work of Christ now being Fully, the mystery of the age is now made known, right? And the gift of the Spirit, they can connect those dots. Amen. I love that passage. When I preached through that years ago, it's just so encouraging. It's so simple and yet so profound at the same time that even the prophets, they searched and inquired into what they had prophesied by right. the Spirit they of Christ. Aware. We tend yeah. to think, oh, the prophets yeah. got it all figured out. Well, they were prophesying under the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit himself, and yet trying to figure out what the referent is to about which they were just talking and writing. And yet right. the, the Holy Spirit superintends all of this. And these are things into which angels, even angels, long to look and just consider the rejoicing of the angels when Christ is raised from the dead and then ascended on high. And all of that that is going on uh, at the time that that Peter is preaching here in Acts chapter 2. Um, it's amazing. Now, you, one thing you also bring up, not only is there quite a bit regarding uh, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, uh, the wonderful case here for taking this as a reference to 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13, but also in Peter's view, at least you raised this issue, uh, Samuel's ministry is kind of viewed in an unexpected way uh, or an intriguing way. What is that? How does Peter understand Samuel's ministry in particular? Why is that maybe, I'm going to use a a 10 cent word here, orthogonal for (laughs) normal readers. (laughs) Why does it come out of left field for most of us? Yeah. um, Well, I think that's, he mentions that in Acts 3. And so you you take both of the sermons together to put it all together. But he says, um, he says in, in his second uh, sermon, he says in verse chap, chapter 3, verse, uh, he's talking about Moses in verse 22 and 23, um, 
every soul that doesn't heed the prophet, God, again, this anistomy language, I will raise up a prophet like mm -hmm. Moses, interestingly, also used of Moses. Very interesting. Uh, he doesn't go there with that, but I think, you know, there's mm -hmm. a possibility it speaks to more than just Jesus' earthly ministry, but nonetheless, I, I, I won't go there either. <laughs> I think didn't. it's but pregnant with the meaning you're thinking more. about. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward announce these days, and he's talking about the sufferings and glory of the Messiah in particular. And so when you were, if you know, you were me, and I even think a, a person living in first century or a Jewish person wouldn't necessarily, if, if they had a, any expectation, a messianic expectation, I don't think you'd go to Samuel um right. the himself, you know <laughs> i think you would you would go to isaiah you know uh you'd go to uh zechariah you know where you see you know the shepherd being struck you, you'd see some obvious texts that talk about uh this this messianic figure being actually suffering um on behalf of others but you wouldn't go to samuel and you wouldn't go you might go to nathan but maybe not because that's more of a positive spin on it but Again, from Samuel onwards, that would include Nathan right there. And Samuel, those two books, um, well, the one book divided in two uh, that bear the name of Samuel the prophet um, also is where you find the Davidic covenant. And so I just think that's, that's another thing that kind of that argues for the idea of the resurrection even being implied there. This, this uh, I will raise up your seat after you and it's it's been a while since I've, I've looked at the actual language of the text but to restore the kingdom i believe is, is at the end of that um in second samuel 7 and it reminds me of acts where is it james at the council of jerusalem talks about the fallen tent of david you mm. know? Oh, so yes. there's something going on here that is bigger than just That's... a successor um, or a series of successors but something, like I said before, more permanent, um, more glorious, and therefore more permanent and eternal. And, and this raising up of the seed. So per perhaps 2 Samuel 7 is also talking about the resurrection of Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a, an oath particularly made to uh, the seed, which is who is Christ. And that's why Solomon, maybe on one level, fulfilled that. He was the first to build the temple. But he certainly did not usher in the everlasting covenant made to David. And we see, finally, in Kings there also, we see the conditional element comes in there. Um, you know, we don't have anything of the conditionality of this everlasting covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7. But then in 1 Kings, David tells his son, if you keep the covenant, then God will make good on his promise to me, I'm paraphrasing. So you do see, that's how you harmonize this idea of unconditionality, conditionality. There is an obedience that the Davidic son has to perform. And none of the sons of David did that perfectly, except one. So I think that's why this unconditionality is really made to that son, Jesus, the perfect son. And, and it speaks of his sufferings because resurrection speaks of suffering. He had to die in order to be resurrected. But, I, you know, I don't want to read too much into it, but we do have the Holy Spirit also as New Covenant believers. Mm -hmm. And there is, he is the one who authored this text through human in, instruments. And so I do think that we can also follow the model, as Dr. Beale has has uh, suggested, of the apostles, their hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we, we have to perform eisegesis, but I think we have to. <laughs> yeah, I think... But, yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, and to see how Peter addresses the Old Testament texts, it's not, and obviously, as we're reading, we're not, we have the Holy Spirit, but we're not inspired, you know, the products of our, of our theological and, and biblical contemplation are not uh, inspired texts. We, we uh, should never think that that's the case. Yet these are not just, um, uh, just some, examples here or there that that uh, we should never approach as a more uh, model for how to to read the bible in other words they're not just giving us information but they're also teaching us how revelation is unfolding it's important giving us a method it's a good way to put it Great point. yeah 
What is um, here in this Peter's second speech, we start to see we've already bled into that a little bit with the, some of the prophetic conversation, but Acts 3, 11 through 26, what, what is the context of this second speech and what significance does that have maybe for understanding uh, Peter's words to, to the people? Well, it, the second speech is in the context, once again, of uh, the, the temple setting in which Peter and John have gone to the temple to pray about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And there's a, blind, not a blind man, a lame man who is begging at the gate, you know, because he can't work, uh, presumably. And so he depends on the mercy of people passing by to give him money. And Peter, uh, basically, he observes the man and led by the spirit, I would suggest, says, look at us, <laughs> you know. And so the man, you know, oh, yeah. And that's when he says, you know, silver and gold I don't have, but I have something greater. In the name of Jesus, walk, basically. And so he takes the man by the hand and 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 begins initial lifting up. And the man jump, you know, the man responds in Leaps. faith. And and he's healed. And he just begins leaping and praising God and you know, just just so ecstatic. You can only imagine how you would feel, you know, if you were, had been crippled and then all of a sudden were miraculously healed. And so it's in within that context of the healing that took place and that they, the, the Peter, again, speaking as a spokesman says, this did not, uh, it's not because of us. Don't be looking at us. It's the power of the name of Jesus that has enabled this man Amen. to be healed. It's not Zeus and, or Hermes. Uh, Adam just preached on Acts 14 yesterday. So. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And a so remarkable this, right. the well, context. <laughs> and I'll be very quick with this, but uh, there's a remarkable parallel between Acts 14, 8 and following, because they're both lame uh, who are healed. Both apostles look intently into the person and both leap, uh, seeming like a, a reference back to the Isianic 35, the lame shall leap like a deer. And uh, interestingly, both the early in the careers of both Peter and Paul, one to an exclusively Jewish uh, audience, one to an exclusively pagan one there in Acts 14, or Gentile one, that uh, these lame healings, which I think are somewhat revelatory of resurrection life, uh, are set forth. The same spirit at work in both apostles. That's great. Wow. I even think of the blind man. You have that also going on. I think it's in Mark's gospel. Uh, sort of forming this idea of the blind the, and the belief motif, the one yes. that gives testimony. What do you want to believe in him too? You know, and then the other one that <laughs> sort of denies Jesus. But yeah, no, that's wonderful. So that's the setting. And again, Peter always uh, uh, filled with the Spirit. Uh, again, points to um, their crucifixion of Jesus. This time, he refers to him as the servant, which is. Um, your the servant his uh, the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he says in verse thirteen of chapter three, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he was when he had decided to release them him how you know, but you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted instead but put to death the Prince of Life oh this is beautiful just I mean just powerful. But God, again, raised him from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So, again, he used, he has this opportunity to proclaim the, the death and, and, and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ and to drive home that point of how they need to repent and return so that they might re also be restored to God. And this is a Jewish audience, right? So... Mm -hmm. They're needing to repent. Right. Whom I love this. Whom heaven must receive, verse twenty, and Jesus until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke about through the mouth of His holy prophets. From ancient. So, in other words, Jesus is reigning now until the consummation. So, right now is the time of the gospel, the time for repentance. He he draws from Moses, raising up the prophet that we already spoke about, and all the prophets from Samuel and his successors announced these days the sufferings of glory of Messiah. And then he hones in on this: it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made to your fathers, saying, To Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you 
by turning every one of you from your wicked way. So that's out again, that's, uh, you know, as a privileged covenant people, what he's basically saying here is something akin to what Paul says in Romans 11, that God has shut out all under disobedience so that he may have mercy on all. They had broken the Mosaic covenant. They were not, they too needed redemption. That's really what the message is. But the gospel was first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. We have that in Romans 1, 16 and 17 as well. So yeah. they need redemption. They're not a privileged, they are a privileged people, but they're also a people who have, broke, their ancestors broke the covenant. And there are many righteous who have been waiting, awaiting these days. They were awaiting something only God can do which he promised to do through the new covenant. So redemption is first to them, but they not, not apart from repentance. And then as we'll see in the book of Acts, as it plays out, because all this begins in Jerusalem with the Jews and the people that come from all over the festival, but then the gospel moves out, you know, to, into Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. Mm. So the Gentiles begin to come in, but all of them, are guilty and all of them need to repent and that's the whole point of jesus offering the reconciliation that he does the servant of the lord Amen. so that is isaiah's servant um, i think that that is probably your next question right <laughs> who is the servant sure yeah well but even on that note just i can't help but think i've been doing quite a bit of work in romans just uh you know as i preach through it and uh, thinking about some of these themes, and a good friend of ours, uh, Dr. Marcus Minninger, teaches New Testament down at um, at Mid America Reform Seminary. He's a did his PhD in Romans one through three. Mm -hmm. But just thinking about all that case, and that, that as Paul is building a case for the necessity of believing on Christ for our salvation, that we're all sinners, and how he focuses even on the Jew. How, it, how we're all sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We need Christ's righteousness. But then what advantage has the Jew? You, you know, people would ask his interlocutor. Way, says, right? Yeah, well, a lot of stuff. It's good. But even in the larger context, Marcus just preached this tremendous sermon at an installation of another friend of ours, Bruce Hollister, who's now our regional home missionary. But it was a, it was a missions-focused sermon from Romans, which on the surface you might not expect that that would be an appropriate text, let alone an entire book. You know, is, is Romans a mission book? Well, it is, but we might not think of that. But Paul was writing because he, Marcus makes the case, you know, he's trying to reap some spiritual benefit, but there's some aspect in which Paul is probably also speaking about um, raising funds so that he can go on to Spain. Part of the issue here with, with uh, his writing to the Romans and wanting to visit them is so that he can be propelled to take the gospel to the Gentiles in Spain, even to the barbarians, <laughs> right? His, his mission is he's obligated to preach these things and he's not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation for all who believe, the Jew first, but also the Gentile, but not, not only the Gentiles, but for the wise ones and the barbarians. <laughs> and so thinking about that here, and I know this is Peter's ministry, but this is that, that same context of the Jews hearing all these messianic promises and, and the fulfillment of these messianic texts, surely we know from the way that they're they're speaking and the cases that are being built in the New Testament, how hard this was for many Old Testament Jews to hear and how, how their expectations were so different from what Christ had actually come to do in, in a suffering servant, a, a one who would, who would triumph and reign over sin. Uh, and, and it just so surprising, but in such a glorious way that the salvation and the, the ministry of the Messiah is so much greater than we may have, that any of these Jews may have even expected or that we would have either um, in our in our context. And I just, I just love seeing the cohesiveness of all that together. And it's beautiful how you bring it out here in Peter's uh, speeches as well. And I think that's why he really presses the death of their, their role in that. And it wasn't just them, it was Pilate too. So we're all guilty, Jew and Gentile, for the crucifixion of Jesus. But he presses that in, you know, and that would have been very sobering, you know, if you were in the crowd listening, you know. And what must we do to be saved was a response to his first sermon, right? It's like, 
we want it. We want. How do we do yeah. that? How do we? How do yeah. we get connected? You know? How do we appropriate? <laughs> right. it? So. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, they were under the influence of the Holy Spirit, as we know that salvation comes only through the gift of God. The mm-hmm. grace of God draws us to to himself. So, well, to get back to where, where you're headed before I uh, interrupted you, uh, oh, speaking of the, <laughs> of the of the suffering servant, uh, you know, why? Why specifically, or at least in your understanding, does does Peter refer to Jesus as a servant? That's a really important word and uh, not used accidentally. Yeah, I I just think um, that he is, you know, the, the term is applied to all of God's, you know, major players and people, Moses, my servant Moses, you know, and so forth. But I just think in this context, the Isianic service servant is probably the best candidate for it. And especially it just fits the overall con- context when he says to you first, and even the whole movement of the book, you know, of Acts, um, beginning with the Jew in Jerusalem and then extending into the Gentile world, which is how the book of Acts flows out, right? And with a lot of Gentile conversions. So I think that the Isianic servant is the best. And, and when you think about you don't just think of Isaiah 53. Most of us are familiar with that passage, speaking of Jesus' death, his crucifixion, and how he brings about justification for the many, right? He sees his offspring as a result of his anguish. But a lot of people don't look at the rest of the Isianic servant songs um, that are, are, there's four of them all together that are all throughout the uh, beginning with Isaiah 40, 42, Mm -hmm. 49, 50, and then of course, closing with 52 Mm. and 53. Um, So this idea of an ancient Near Eastern understanding of this servant term is a trusted representative. So it's God's trusted representative. And so here we have him in, in chapter 42 of Isaiah, uh, bringing justice to the world, you know, true justice. You have that theme earlier also in Isaiah um, 9 and 11. So uh, some, I do believe uh, Dr. Oswald and others have done work in this, showing that the servant, Dr. Alexander is too, the, the Messianic king depicted in chapters 9 and 11 of Isaiah also, uh, same words are used for the servant. So there's also even within the book of Isaiah a hint that, this coming Messiah, this stump of Jesse, root of Jesse, will will actually be one who comes to suffer. Um, but I think uh, the, one of my favorites in, in the servant songs would be, uh, I think it's in 49, I have it written down here. Um, so God raises him up to regather the lost tribes of Israel. Well, or the the scattered tribes. Mm -hmm. Why are they scattered? Well, the Northern kingdom, right? We're taken over by the Assyrians because of disobedience. And then the Southern kingdom by the Babylonians. And so everybody went into exile. Um, The Northern kingdom was probably assimilated to some degree and Judah, the Southern kingdom retained to some degree, but nonetheless, even returning to the land, they still hadn't returned to the days of the glory days of, you know, a United kingdom, under a messianic uh, leader or under kingship. And so they were, they were waiting for that period of time. So part of the servant's work is to go and recollect them, to restore Israel and Judah, the brothers, to come together again. And then you hear a sweet thing with God saying through the prophet, it's too small of a thing that I raise you up just to do that. I'm also going to make you a light to the nation so that my salvation may go forth to the ends of the earth. And so the, the servant has a mission. It's more than just to re- restore the lost tribes of Israel, to regather yeah. them back to God, right. but also to gather in the nations. And even that's not a, night, a new idea. You see that way back in Genesis, where with the calling of Abraham, I will make you a father of a multitude, not just his own offspring, but also... Uh, offspring that will come under the benefit of Abraham, the blessing to the nation. So but it's through the servant's work. So there's progression here as we see this. And I believe that, that that's what Peter's referring to, this precious servant 
For you first, God raised up his servant to you, Israel, and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. So the servant has been given for their justification, you know, and they need to repent. That, that's his gift, you know, to turn them from that and return to God. So I think that, that the Isaiah service, particularly chapter 49, would be the one in view, as well as, of course, 53. All the servant songs are beautiful. He's the suffering servant, is, gives his, you know, his beard to be plucked out. He's, he suffers shame and humiliation. He, um, he is so gentle, you know, a smoldering wick he would never uh, snuff out, meaning he deals very gently with the people, which is a complete picture of Jesus. Come to me, all you are, you know, weary and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you. You know, take my yoke on me, upon you, for my yoke is easy, and you will find rest. So, so I mean, it's just a beautiful characterization of, of you know, kind of a sketch of, of Jesus, of his person and work. Yeah. So, so I, from, from Isaiah. I love how you bring that out. And I was so struck when I worked through chapter three that, that uh, yes, there are the, he is a suffering servant, but there Peter really lays him out as the glorified the resurrected servant and all that that now means for Israel and beyond. Mm -hmm. But uh, thinking a little more about the uh, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, what what are the primary components of the Abrahamic covenant, and how do you see those as informing uh, Peter's uh, use of the seed promise? Well, the the major components. There's a lot there, but I would. Um, I would refer you to, uh, in, for a great treatment on this, would be a lot of Dr. Alexander's work, because that's one of the areas he works in the Abrahamic mm -hmm. Covenant. But just to summarize it, um, you have uh, a great, a great, um, you will become a great nation, Abraham. So these, these promises are laid out in Genesis chapter 12. That means that he will have biological offspring, i.e. the Jewish nation, the Israel, Israelite nation, will become actual physical offspring through the seed of Abraham, who will be one lone seed, Isaac, where it, where it all right. begins, um, the promised seed back there in chapter 12. In chapter 15, the covenant of circumcision, where Abr Abram's name is changed to Abraham to re reflect a change in status, where he'll, whereby he will now become the father of a multitude of nations, which seems to extend beyond his own physical offspring to include Gentiles, the nations. As the Gentiles, as we would understand the first century, but the nations, as they would have understood that during Abraham's time. And at that time, also kings will come forth from you. You have the, the promise of a great name and kingship. So great nation, great name is how I do the second uh, major promise. Um, Sarah's name is changed also because she's a mother of kings. So this anticipates kingship. And, and in another place, I, I see that all going back also to Genesis, because Adam was the first king, right? So it's a restoration of humanity's kingship and status. That's how I'm seeing this. So it's, it's a slow progression of how God does that. So great nation, great name, which is associated with kingship, and that in your seed, all the nations will be blessed. So blessing to the nations through the seed of Abraham. And I think that the closest referent to that the language of the text if you if you if you deal with you know just looking at the language of the text because blessing to the nations is all over the place in genesis you know with the abrahamic narrative but i think uh chapter 22 of genesis that the the near sacrifice of isaac yeah. i think that would be the likely candidate uh in my view for uh peter's reference to that hmm. and um that, as you recall, that's, that is such a beautiful, that's a striking passage. And I think it's an, yet another way when God gives us a, a little sketch um, before it happens of what he's intending to do, how he's intending to do it. Yeah. And that within the frame of being asked, but we're told he's being, he's tested. So if you're reading the narrative, you know, chapter 22 closely, you notice several clues that you expect to have Isaac back at the end of the story. Mm hmm that he's being tested to see whether or not, you know, the obedience of faith will follow through. So Abraham's already justified because he believed God, right? Chapter 15. But now in chapter 17, walk before me and be blameless. Now he's going to be tested 
uh, the obedience of faith comes through. He's willing to sacrifice his one and only son. I think that occurs your only son, your beloved son, the son whom you love. I think two or three times it occurs. So, Promised son. Yeah. And so um, that echoes into the New Testament, God's one and only son, really. Mm. And then a substitute is provided, right, at the very last moment. And it's on the basis of that the oath is sworn. That's where you see the oath in terms of uh, the, the ratification of the covenant. Um, Scott Hahn has written on this uh, in his kingship, I think, in covenant, I think, kinship, I think, in covenant, a Roman Catholic scholar um, who does a pretty good job, I think, of, of kind of laying that out. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, uh, this oath by my, about the ratification part, but by myself, I have sworn, this is the angel of the Lord speaking on behalf of the Lord, <clears throat> declares the Lord, because you have done this thing, Abraham, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Again, that's, you know, the echo, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, as of the sand, which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate. And now NASB has their enemies, but in the Hebrew, it's his enemies. It's a mm, singular. Yeah. Yeah. Pronoun. So uh, in your in, in your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. So I, it's that oath also that sees us through the end to Jesus, despite what Israel does, right? It's the Abrahamic oath. And and I mean, you heard you heard Peter talk about that, you know, the God of our fathers, and and so God does not lie. He, he gives you an oath. That oath is going to come through. So, but it's interesting. It's all within the frame of the testing of Abraham, the obedience of faith that's there, but really the yes. picture that God will provide a substitute. Amen. I love Abraham, that passage so much. Yeah. So. Yeah. You see. It's just so striking, and it's unusual. I can't think of another passage quite like it, Genesis 22, in the sense that we have three types of Christ acting and being acted upon one another. Abraham as the obedient son and servant, uh, Isaac as the promised seed, the heir and the child, who, uh, and then the expectation of the, this promise going through him, but then also the ram itself as the substitute. So you see Christ, the Christ is the antitype for all three of them. Uh, yeah. and, and, and I don't know of any, obviously Christ is, is depicted in many ways in the old Testament, but I might be lack, you know, my memory might be failing me, but th this passage seems unique to me in, in the way that it heightens how all of these different themes intersect upon Christ right here in anticipation. And you see him laying down the son and Isaac, the willing son, you know, Dad, absolutely the all the above. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. You know, I love how you how you draw those themes together, but then also uh, connect them with those those Abrahamic covenants. Ultimately, the, the the aspects of which are a people and a place and a name and and the kingship that you just described. But, um, how does this fit into Jesus becoming then the blessing for for the nations more broadly? I mean, there's a certain order in which which Christ comes, and and even this is reflected in Peter's or Paul's ministry uh, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile, and how the gospel itself kind of reverberates even in the Book of Acts with the mm -hmm. with the the Jews first, and then spreading out. So we we don't have two Pentecosts so much as we have the pouring out of the Holy Spirit first to the Jews, and then later, if I'm not mistaken, is it in nine? Or earlier than that, um, we see it poured out first in uh, him poured out in, in Acts 2, and then later it's poured out to the Gentiles. And, and there's this this progression. Um, what do we see here in terms of that accomplishment being a fulfillment of, of Old Testament promises? What does Peter's sermon teach us about Jesus not being the Savior of Jews only, but the Savior of the whole world? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, I, again, if we go back to Genesis, the beginning, and we have God's original intent for creation and humanity, and how that all uh, got followed up with the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and how sin and death entered the world because of that, and just how corrupt the, the world became and humanity became under the instigation of this serpent and 
how it continues to be corrupted, this present evil age, you know, that Jesus will, we await for a savior who will rescue us, who will ultimately uh, consummate and bring in uh, the age to come. So this Jesus reigning now. So the, the gospel, the good news is he has freed us from our sins, right? From, from the, the power, the dominion of sin, from the ability to, of Satan to accuse us any longer. We have that in the book of Revelation. He can no longer um, accuse us to God with respect to our sins. Um, as you see in, you know, maybe Zechariah and other places, um, Job, uh, you know, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So we continue as those who follow the apostles, as believers, as a priest of all believers, declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's really our, our job is to, is to live a gospel oriented life, not just for my personal salvation, but um, for a global salvation. And the gospel, as it goes forward as a kingdom that has been inaugurated, not just, again, personal salvation, but an idea of a kingdom that is really already inaugurated and yet to be consummated. Today is a day of salvation, just like it was then in the first century. The latter days had been uh, ushered in, had been brought in. We've been in those from how I understand the New Testament, and we will continue in the latter days until we get closer to the end days and then the final wrapping up of history. So the, the blessing to the nations is salvation. It's, it's, to de, it's deliverance from the power and dominion of sin and slavery to sin and slavery to the devil and eternal damnation and the wrath of God at the end of the age when he comes to judge the living and the dead. So it's on the basis of Jesus as the second Adam, Messiah, now ascended, 1 Corinthians 15, putting all enemies under his feet, Presently, in this present age, as the gospel also goes forward, inviting people to come in, um, and at the very end, as in his role as Messiah, he will hand over everything to the Father, which is what the first Adam should have done. So the second Adam does yeah, that. Adam. <laughs> I need so to get that busy. he may be all in all, and Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, right? So the messianic uh, function has been fulfilled at the consummation. So Amen. that's a lot said, but it's it's really a restoration, Amen. creation lost, creation restored. Because at the very end of Revelation, we see a garden setting. We see the lamb and God in our midst. No longer do we need temple walls to separate us from God's presence. We are in the immediate presence of God. And that is the blessing to the nations. It's salvation and restoration to be reconciled to God, to deliver us from wicked ways and an empty way of life. And that initially began at Pentecost, the fullness of what that revelation was in the Old Testament come to light through the power of the Spirit. And it's through the power of the Spirit that this, this enables us to enter into the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel. Amen. A wonder, <laughs> wonderful. You know, what was promised to Adam, even in the covenant of works, that higher consummate life was forfeited upon his sin. But praise be to God that he did not see fit to to condemn us and to uh, destroy us all at that very instant, but to offer us salvation through the seed of the woman, the salvation through Jesus Christ, so that he brings us now through redemption to that ultimate glorious consummate end uh, to which the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, it all pointed forward to in the first place. That is truly the promise. And that's what we're talking about here with this book, The Seed of Promise, The Sufferings and Glory of the Messiah, Our Redeemer. He, he offered his full obedience, both actively and passively. You know, I'm using that in a technical way. Uh, he, he lived for us. He also died for us, and he was raised for our salvation. And um, to see that reflected in manifold ways through Scripture in this book is, is tremendous, uh, but also particularly in this chapter, The Sufferings and Glory of Jesus the Messiah in Acts 2 and 3. It's been a pleasure, uh, Rita, to speak with you and to, to talk a bit and about the, the primary and now the secondary uh, resources uh, given to us by Dr. T. Desmond Alexander. Thanks, Rita. This has been a pleasure. Thanks for putting this book together, and thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to have you back soon. And, of course, check out online. We're going to have links not only to this book so that you can purchase a copy, but also uh, to our previous discussion on Genesis 6. 
Sometimes yes. we get questions on that, but uh, we loved having that conversation a few years ago and look forward to uh, fielding any questions. If anyone uh, has any questions today or, or, or on our previous episodes, you can always contact us at mail at reformedforum.org. And our, our dutiful uh, friend, Ryan Noah, will do his best to direct your question. Mostly, he just is the expert and can answer everything on his own. But uh, um, he can also get in touch with us and we can get back to you. Uh, check out the website, reformedforum.org, uh, for updates. We've got uh, new books coming out very soon. I hope to be sending them some PDFs to publishers or to printers today. We're the publisher. Uh, but uh, we also have some new online courses uh, through Reformed Academy. A lot of exciting things there. Pray for us and some new opportunities we have this year. And uh, just pray, ultimately, that, that Christ would continue to um, work his salvation in the, through his spirit in the, life, the lives of all of his people throughout the world. And if we could be just a little bit of a part of that, uh, it just delights us uh, in service of Christ and obviously of his church around the world. So those are all the ways to get in touch with us. But of course, I do want to thank you for listening. And we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.